Welcome to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? I'm Erin Summers. I'm a sports broadcaster that's covered the Atlantic Coast Conference for a very long time, and I grew up a fan. I've always been curious what players do after we obsess over them in college. This podcast answers that question. Each week, you'll hear an interview with a former ACC athlete. We'll find out everything they've been doing since playing in college. Thanks for listening. Let's jump in to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? This week, I'm joined by former Clemson guard Terrence Oglesby. In his freshman year at Clemson, Oglesby hit 85 three-pointers and led the team from outside the following year with 92. Both years were good for second best in the ACC. Since college, Oglesby has stayed close to the game, whether it's been playing abroad, coaching, or broadcasting. Here's our conversation. Terrence, I'm so happy that you were able to join me today. Definitely a name that I recognize growing up in the ACC, watching basketball. I mean, you were deadly from outside. Anybody that's familiar with Clemson basketball knows that. Well, where are you calling in from today, and, and how have you been? I, I've been well. I've been well. I'm calling in from uh, Clemson, South Carolina. My family just moved back. Uh, I played for a long time and then uh, came back to the upstate to finish my degree because I left after two years. So I finished my degree and then also uh, received my degree, my master's degree in athletic leadership. And my wife fell in love with the place. My kids love their daycare. So it just kind of turned into, we just kind of stuck around. And I took a job uh, coaching for a year back in Tennessee where I'm from and it didn't work out. And we had some, some family developments. My father passed away suddenly. So uh, I got out of coaching and now we're back in the upstate uh, and I'm living the dream. I, uh, other than uh, not being able to go out to dinner as much as I want to, uh, <laughs> we've been pretty happy for the most part. All right, well, let's take it back to the very beginning when the dream actually started. You're from Norway. Yes. What, what got you into basketball to begin with? Uh, did your research. Very nice. My dad, uh, <laughs> my dad played professional, and uh, he played at Carson Newman University and met my mother over there. And uh, I've just always been around it. So he, he was in Norway for a while, and then he moved to Holland. Uh, we were there, followed him, went to Australia for a little while when I was young. And then when I came of elementary school age, he decided, you know, it was time to hang it up and move back. And uh, I've just always been around it. I've always loved it. And uh, I spent some time on the Norwegian junior national teams and sometimes on the senior team too. But uh, it, it's funny the way it works out because uh, – my, my dad met my mother uh, where I was from in Norway, which is Kongsberg. It's about two hours southwest of Oslo. And uh, I met my wife in Sweden, which was a four-hour drive away. So you tell me how that happens. I don't know how that happens. But uh, ever since uh, I can remember, my dad was always uh, just kind of towing me around. And I just fell in love with it. I enjoyed comp- being competitive and, and – uh, one thing I love about playing basketball is it doesn't matter what kind of economic situation you're in. It doesn't matter once you get to start to play, when, when, once you get to play. And uh, ever since then, I've just enjoyed it. And it's just something you could do when there was nothing to do. And I grew up in Tennessee for most of my childhood. And there were times where there were no, there was nothing to do. <laughs> you mentioned Tennessee, Bradley uh, Central High School, where you played all time yeah. leading scorer. Over 2,500 points. When you were in high school and having so much success, what was the attention like? You know, it was a little bit before this whole Instagram era. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was a kid, too, that was really prideful in where I was from. I really enjoy Bradley Central. I I, I go back and and I – I'm, I'm still very familiar with the program. I keep up with all the coaches and everything of that nature. Um, the attention where I was from, it, it was a lot, but I, I, I never really did much but play. So mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't, you know, go out and really hunt attention. It was, it, it, it kind of, kind of followed you some places, but it wasn't like now where kids are getting 150,000 Instagram followers Crazy. and all that mess. It's, it's too much. It's too much. And, and, and it's too much for a lot of kids because they can't play and they're still getting that kind of attention. And, well, uh, then- well, how was your recruiting process then? I mean, now you you get DMs, people are messaging you on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever. It's crazy. But what was your process like? If there's a coach recruiting on TikTok, I'm mad at him already, <laughs> and I want to know about it. But uh, <laughs> uh, 
it, it all worked through my dad, Warren, uh, and a guy who I played for in the summer named Charlie Benson was kind of the intermediary between a lot of coaches to kind of understand what it was going on. Because Charlie and I grow way back, and he even goes back way back with my father. So that's kind of how that worked out. But uh, they all had to pass the dad test. And uh, once it got past the dad test, my mom had some influence, but it was mostly dad who controlled the whole thing. And my dad really liked uh, Clemson uh, because of Jim Davis. Ironically enough, it was the women's coach, but Jim Davis is from uh, Charleston, Tennessee, which is 15 minutes up the road from Cleveland, Tennessee. And that's kind of how mm -hmm. that whole thing worked out. Uh, but my dad loved Clemson. He, he really liked Oliver. And then uh, he really, really liked Tommy Amaker and Seth Greenberg. And Tommy Amaker was at Michigan at the time. And then uh, Greenberg was at Virginia Tech. So that was kind of the whole – that was kind of my final three, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I never visited Virginia Tech because as soon as I stepped foot on campus at Clemson, it reminded me a little bit of home, just rolling hills, a lot of green and, and things of that nature. And I always had access to the basketball gym and, and some of their academic stuff to where I knew – uh, I would be okay as far as that's concerned. And, uh, and you know, not to mention Clemson being a top, well, I think top 25 public institution in the country. That's right when they were jumping up into that. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and it was an intriguing factor. Clemson was on the rise. And, um, you know, I grew up a Florida basketball fan. And Billy Donovan, we had been in contact. And uh, they took a kid named Donnie Mack. They wanted me to wait to see if he was uh, going to qualify or not. He ended up not qualifying, goes to Memphis. And uh, that happened like two months after I'd already committed to Clemson. And I had fallen in love with Clemson. I'd fallen in love with the way they were playing at the time. And that's just how that whole thing ended up. But I think by the time it was all said and done, I have my letters stacked up somewhere. But I think by the time it was all said and done, I had a 50 or 60 scholarship offers uh, at one level or another. Yeah, um, I think in the power five, it ended up being 10 to 15. I, I, basically everybody, but the blue bloods it, that I was kind of that second tire. Once you get mm -hmm. out of that, like Duke and North Carolina, it was everybody after that. And I would consider Michigan a blue blood now. And, and even then, but Amaker was struggling just a, a tad bit, but the big Ten's difficult as you know. So, yep. Yeah. That's a great story. 2007, when you joined the squad, you spent two years at Clemson. What were some of your favorite times, memories on the court? Uh, to be honest with you, we played Florida state at home my freshman year and it was a barn burner. Uh, like it was a double OT game. Um, Trevor Booker, I hit a last second shot at, to go into overtime and then James Mays hit one to go into double. And then I caught fire in the second overtime. And that was a really fun game. Maryland, obviously when I hit the game winner to put us into the tournament that year, that was a good one. But the one that stands out probably the most to me, um, my freshman year was when we went to the ACC championship. Uh, I think we were the second Clemson team ever do it. And, uh, the attention surrounding that, like we, it was funny because we, we got in, we had the, the first two days off. We played Boston college in the first round and we had the first two by days and to check in to that hotel that year, it was pretty sparse in the, in the lobby when we first got there. By the time we had won that semifinals game against Duke, we couldn't get to the elevator. They had to get us around in the back because it just, Everybody loves a winner, I guess, but, every, but everything, we couldn't get up to the lobby. And um, it was pretty cool because we, a couple of years ago when the ACC tournament was in Charlotte again, uh -huh. and I was helping uh, Brownell, you know, the new regime, uh, we stayed in the same hotel. So that was, it was kind of like a flashback, but it, it was, that was two of the bigger things. Your freshman year, you had 85 threes. You went six of 10 against South Carolina. I mean, you had so many good games. How are you so good from outside? Oh, gosh. I just repped. Uh, I, I shot and shot and shot. I, I, and I knew what I was, I was there to do. Uh, and, you know, I, I was lucky that I played for somebody like Coach Purnell because, like, I, some of those shots now I was taking were questionable. Mm -hmm. They were questionable. And, uh, you know, he just kind of let me go. He's like, well, if you're going to take those and you're going to shoot 40%, I'm not going to tell you no. So, you know, we didn't run a whole lot of, we didn't run a whole lot of stuff. It was basically me hunting shots all the time. 
And I had a really good point guard with uh, DeMontez Stitt, who was able to give mm -hmm. me shots my sophomore year. Uh, rest in peace, buddy. I don't know if you know that situation, but DeMontez passed away. He, he was just a phenomenal person, and, and I hate that. But uh, he, would, he was able to give me shots my sophomore year. My freshman year, Cliff Hammonds, uh, who was an absolute stud of a human, not just a basketball player, but a stud of a human. Um, I, I played with some good players, you know, Casey Rivers and, and – I was the best. I, I was the best version of myself because I was probably the third option on my sophomore year. Because you had Trevor Booker, you had Casey Rivers. You really had to worry about those guys, and it was nice because I was kind of that third guy, and I could play so much off of those guys because they re, they required so much attention, and uh, I was able to get open shots. And whether it was on the line or about four feet off of it, I, I had the green light from Coach Purnell, so that was a good. <laughs> that was a good thing. <laughs> You played two years at Clemson. Why did you decide after two years that you were done playing college ball and you wanted to go pursue a professional career? Well, to be honest with you, I, uh, I didn't have enough information. I, I'm, really, I'm really jealous of today's guys, to be honest with you. Um, Draft Express had me pegged as a second round pick after my senior year, excuse me. And uh, my goal was, well, I'm only 6'2". I wasn't thinking like Jimmer Fredette. I should have thought more like Jimmer Fredette. I'm only 6'2". I need to go to Europe. I need to learn how to play the point guard position. And I wasn't going to play the point guard position at Clemson because obviously I wasn't going to. We, we, we just had studs at that spot. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I could go over for a year, play pretty well, and then come back in the back end of the first round maybe next year. And uh, I didn't have enough information. That was stupid on my part. I was a 20-year-old, super eager dude who had high goals. Uh, that's probably a fault of mine. That, nothing changes, just the direction changes. I still have high goals. Uh, but it, I, I'm really jealous of today's guys because they're able to get that stuff, talk to agents, come back, figure out what your draft stock is or position is. And if they would have said, hey, you're going to be late second or undrafted, I would have come back to school, uh, but I was kind of left to my own devices and I was getting information from a European agent who didn't quite have all of his uh, gathering together. And I just got some bad advice. And um, do I regret it? Not particularly because I was, I, I went after what I wanted. And sometimes when you go after uh, you don't quite get it, but I, I, I was still able to turn it into about 10 years. So I, I'm not overly bitter, but there are times where you sit and you wonder like, should I have done that or not? And uh, a lot of good came out of it. I met my wife. I have two beautiful kids. I have a, a, a Rottweiler named Rosie who uh, doubles as the house pig because she's gotten too fat. She's getting a little old. But <laughs> a, lot has, uh, a lot has transpired because of it. And I'm very appreciative for the experience that I gained. But uh, I just didn't have enough information, quite frankly. That was a long you, way to say that, wasn't it? No, that was it's a fine. Long way I, to say. I, I appreciate know. long I mean, answers. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you it's mentioned your podcasts. goals and how the direction of your goals changed. At that point, what was the goal? Was it to make it to the NBA? Yes, it was. I, I, I was trying to Steve Kerr it. I, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't naive enough to think that I was going to, uh, you know, be somebody like Steph Curry or or somebody like Clay Thompson who was going to get. Or I, I was thinking I was going to be somebody who could come in off the bench and shoot 40, 40 or 45 percent from three on low attempts, play 10 to 15 minutes and make some money. Mm -hmm. That was that was my thought process going through. Uh, I knew that I wasn't naive to that. And I still think it could have been done. But I, th the path I took was not the most uh, efficient. And I got stuck in some tough places because as soon as I got over there, <laughs> this is a, a quick story. Uh, as soon as I got over there, uh, the team I signed with was Napoli Basket, which is in the first division in Italy. And it's that's at the time, that's when Brandon Jennings came out. Nick Calathus did the same thing. He went to Greece. And I went over there <laughs> and I stayed for two months. They're like, yeah, we're going to pay you. We're going to pay you. So I was like, okay, that's fine. They're, they're going to pay me. So they handed me a check and I went to the bank because everybody started figuring out like, Hey, these checks, they're bouncing. So we were going to get these checks and they actually brought me into the back of the bank because I was like, Hey, I need to cash this out. Cause I'm about to go home and they're, what is, what is this? What is this? And turn around and 
they took me back. They thought I was trying to get over on this Italian bank in Naples, <laughs> Italy. All I'm down to do is get my first professional paycheck, no dice. And then I get only, I, I didn't get a dollar for two months. Meanwhile, I come back to, I come back to the States right when season's starting and Clemson starts out seven and oh, and I'm just bitter as all hell. Oh, God. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so first job out, didn't get a dollar and the team folded before the season started. So uh, there you have it. <laughs> I was wondering what happened because I saw that you didn't actually ever play for them after you signed with them. And I, but I've heard stories about people not getting paid overseas. I think it's better now, but I do. Yeah, it was definitely a thing. Yeah, it's still a thing. It's still a thing. And, uh, you know, the problem is, is a lot of guys are not paying as much now initially. So only maybe the top zero one percent of European guys get paid everything that they're owed. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, you have to basically go to FIBA and sue them. But it costs $10,000 to sue them. So like right. some guys will really have a hard time. Like say you're getting paid five grand a month. They're getting two check. That's two months work to sue them and you may or may not win. Right. So it's kind of a, a difficult situation for, for guys that go over there. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's hard. And I've heard some <laughs> horror stories. I've had the worst stories than, than what I've got. You know, I, I've been reasonably fortunate, you know, I've, there's been, I played in Spain and there's paychecks that show up a month late, but you know, they, they make sure that everything for the most part is taken care of, but uh, I've got stories, uh, more than an ACC podcast, but, but uh, I've, got, <laughs> I've got some good ones. Where was your favorite place to play? Cause you were in Ukraine, Spain, France, Sweden, you mentioned Italy. Yeah. Uh, Sweden. Uh, the pay wasn't as great. Uh, but the guy I worked for, it was in Barros. Uh, that's where I met my wife. Of course, that's a, that's, that's an also. That's why it's your thing. favorite place. That's the one reason among <laughs> others, but, uh, they they really took care of you and uh, while the pay wasn't as good the living situation was great uh very nice people a little conservative when you initially meet them until they have a couple of drinks and then the swedes just open right up and they're everybody's mm -hmm. best friend but it usually takes a little liquid courage for them to get rolling but uh yeah so i i would say sweden just because the enthusiasm for basketball uh in that particular city uh the way they treated you as a human. And uh, I, I still have some of my best friends. And that was one of the first years I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go into this year and I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to enjoy where I'm at. And uh, I had my best season uh, playing there, averaged close to 20 points a game in the regular season and uh, made an all league team. And then uh, I also liked the Republic of Georgia, but for different reasons. Uh, it was a little bit more difficult. The living situation was terrible. but I love the people that I got to meet there. It was such, it was such a different place. It was like going back in time a little bit because it was such a masculine culture. So like, you know, when you talk to some dude, you're like, dude, that guy's a little chauvinistic right now. He's acting a little yeah. crazy. You know what I'm saying? Every one of them, every one of them. <laughs> it was just some of the most blasphemous things I've ever heard, but they just didn't know any better. And that was just their culture. So yeah. for me, it was just, it was flipping everything. I know I have a Norwegian mother. You want to talk about the most like equal society. I'm married to a Swedish yeah. woman. Like she bosses me around like crazy other way around, other way around. Uh, like it was for me, it got to a point because I didn't do well in Ukraine the first time since I was 20. I wanted to go back to the Eastern Bloc and learn. And uh, I went and enjoyed that. I was, I, I had an MVP season there and the uh, league, league was okay. Not great. But uh, <laughs> those guys, man, that was a different sort of uh, – where, Khabib, where Khabib is from. Khabib mm -hmm. Nurm uh, Nurmagomedov, that's where he's from. Uh -huh. And just a really uh, different culture, uh, some good guys. But they would, uh, they would say some things or be like, you've got to be kidding me right now. But, it, but that was part of the intrigue because I would, they were just so crazy. You know, the yeah. toilets didn't work. They'd shut water off for two weeks at a time. My wife was miserable. She was mad at me. I couldn't do anything about my baby. What you want me to do? They cut the water off. Like, I can't over here and just flip a switch. <laughs> uh, but just uh, so Sweden and the Republic of Georgia. My wife won't agree with the Republic of Georgia. But Sweden, for sure, Republic of Georgia has got to be my, my, my second. You had an opportunity to play for a developmental league for a little bit. I did. When that opportunity came up and you were there, what was going through your head? 
I, I thought I had learned. Uh, I thought I had learned how to be successful um, as far as being a professional basketball player. And I had when it came to being in Europe and doing that whole thing. Um, that opportunity was kind of strange because Matt Woodley, who now works for Forbesy at Wake, mm-hmm. um, he had recruited me at Middle Tennessee State before he went to Washington State, and then he did some D-League stuff. He's from Iowa, so he was working with the Iowa Energy. So I got in contact with him and just asked him questions. And um, I was curious because I was like, you know, I'm 27, 28. I'd like to give it one more shot. And I got there, and it, that was just such a difficult thing to do because – you know, they had Russ Smith with the Grizzlies, who was a second round pick, but they had him on a two way and Andrew Harrison was there. So they were trying to develop him and uh, I gave it a go, but I would be ready to play. And 10 minutes before uh, everything would start out, Russ Smith would just walk through the door. So I'd basically wasted a whole day trying to prepare as opposed to like yeah. really getting a, a workout in or whatever. Right. So I would lose a day. and. It, it was just really difficult for a lot of people involved as far as uh, – I, I have so much more respect now for, like, the Mike Millers of the world, the James Joneses of the world, guys who can come in, like, four minutes a game and knock down, like, three threes. I couldn't do that. I was more of a rhythm guy. Like, I had to be, the, be in there for a while. And, um, you know, I just – to be honest with you, I just wasn't good enough at that time. I, it, was, it was hard. The situation was difficult. My wife was pregnant. Um, but I, 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 sw- I, I swung. I swung and I missed, but I swung. So I, I'm not. I'm not all uh, too. Uh, what, what's the right word? Uh, what's the right word? Uh, regretful. I'm not regretful mm-hmm. on that at all. I gave it a shot. There you go. When you were done playing overseas, what went into that decision, and then what did you want to do after that? I didn't know that I was done. Um, I came back to Clemson because. Uh, I knew I needed to finish my degree. I was about a year and a half out. And um, I called Leslie Moreland, who is an angel of a human. She's one of the uh, athletic, she's the athletic uh, academic counselor for, for bath, men's basketball. And mm-hmm. I think golf or something. And uh, she doesn't have to work as hard on golf, I don't think. I think those guys uh, take care of their academics pretty well. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I called her. I was like, hey, how much do I need have left? What do I need to do? And she says, oh, well, we have this uh, Tiger Trust program. They'll actually fund uh, your, entire, your, the, the, your entire scholarship because you left because of the sport that you were competing at the university. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I came back and I was like, well, what kind of online classes that can I take so that whenever I go back, I can still take classes. I was on campus and, and a guy named Lucas McKay called me and uh, who's now an assistant coach at uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City. And uh, he called me. He's like, hey, I heard you were on campus. We haven't met. I'd love to meet you in person. Um, we'd love to have you around the guys. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I you know, just come and, and, and see a practice or something. He's like, well, if, if you decide to move back, you know, we might be able to work something out. So I was getting old. I was tired. I was tired of waiting on jobs because I had gotten, on, I had gotten to the point where um, – people were really swinging for the fences with rookies. And then they knew if the rookie didn't work out, then they would call me. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they would cut the kid and then they knew I was for certain. So they would bring me back. And I, I got tired of waiting until November for jobs. And once he said, you know, we might be able to work something out. So he said, you'd have to get through Brown out. So uh, am I allowed to curse on this? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my dumbass <laughs> walks into an individual workout, which is frowned upon. <laughs> and uh and in a suit in a suit and just and they had no idea who i was uh brown didn't recognize me until i went up and shook his hand and said hey i'm terrence Oglesby. I, I used to play here i'd love to be a part if if there's anything i can do to help and that just kind of went from uh going from there to all of a sudden i was traveling with the team to all of a sudden they uh tim Bure couldn't make it to a game so uh who usually does uh, color for the radio. You know, Tim Bray, an absolute mm-hmm. legend. I'm doing a radio show with him later today, beside the point. But, but uh, they were like, well, do you want to do radio? I was like, well, sure. So I'm traveling with the guys doing radio when Bray doesn't show up. I'm helping them warm up and being a part of scout team. And I was still in good enough shape 
to uh, to practice every day. So I, they mm -hmm. would use me in different uh, capacities depending on the day. So I kind of got an in-depth look of, of how all that stuff worked uh, on the other side, which made me very appreciative. But uh, that's kind of how I ended up back in Clemson the first time. Uh, now we took a trip and then came back, but uh, that's how I ended up back at Clemson. And not only did I receive my undergrad uh, in a total of three years, but I ended up getting my master's degree in, uh, over the course of, I want to say, 18 months. So I, I got everything done in about four and a half years. So I, I'm very appreciative to Clemson. I got my degrees, my diplomas, just like you do over there. But I got my diploma uh, hung up over here on the side that I'm, I'm very proud of. And uh, my mom was really proud of. So that was good. <laughs> Definitely. So that was good. I do have to make sure that you were getting paid during this, that you were working. I, I got all my, st I, I, I did work. Uh, when, it, when it comes to getting paid, not so much. But I, <laughs> I got, uh, I got, golly, I, I didn't realize, you know, it, there's a big debate now on, on if guys are getting paid and, and if they should get paid. And, and uh, it's something I kind of ring in on because I, I'm not going to say this, like, I'm not trying to sound like a jerk, but I could have made a little bit of money when I was playing in college mm -hmm. if that opportunity presented itself. Um, felt like I was pretty relatable to the state of South Carolina for uh, other reasons. But, like, it was just uh, – I, I could have made some money. But I didn't realize how much money goes into these kids when it comes to travel. You know, they're mm -hmm. chartering jets. Now they're catering food. Now they live in special – uh, houses on campus that are so much nicer. I mean, we're talking 12 years ago that are so much nicer than what they have now. They get unlimited Nike gear pretty much whenever they ask for it. Uh, you know, when it comes to each kid, they're getting uh, so much stuff. They're, you're getting your money spent for you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Sure, yeah. they probably, if they got a little extra, what is it, Paterno used to say, I, that's a bad person to bring into a sports thing, <laughs> but Paterno used to say, like, oh, well, if they need a little extra money for pizza, and, and that's fine. But, like, these kids are getting, I, I say kids, I need to say young men. These young men are getting fed, they're getting treatment, they're not having to take out insurance outside of what their family already has. Uh, so I was getting all those benefits. Now, I wasn't getting paid a whole lot, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and I didn't need it. Uh, at the time because I'd played for so long, but, but yeah, that's, I, I'm the worst, Aaron. I'm sorry. I, I get going, I get, I get rolling and it's just, uh, I'm the worst. I appreciate so. somebody that wants to talk more than somebody who doesn't believe me. It's a lot harder <laughs> if you don't talk. <laughs> yeah. You get stuck sometimes with some yeah. bands. That's the hard one. Well, you, so you were at Clemson, you were kind of coaching, you kind of got into that for a little while. Mm -hmm. What made you decide like to pursue coaching or not? And um, what was kind of next for you after that? Well, I, I, I took a job at Carson Newman University back in Tennessee uh, mm -hmm. working for, I said Charlie Benson earlier. So his son, Chuck Benson, uh, was the head coach at, Car at Carson Newman. And he called and offered me the job. We were about to play NC State in the ACC tournament. And he called and offered me the job. I was still a GA kind of running around. And I took it because I thought it would be a good way to get on the road and recruit. And I'm kind of happy that, that I, I took the job. Uh, because I, I found out fairly quickly that uh, I want to be happy when I go home from work. I want to <laughs> I want to be able to see my kids, yeah. and I'm I'm very people oriented, and I I enjoy being around people, and I, I enjoy talking and, and going back and forth. Yeah, but I don't do like well with moody. I don't do well with <laughs> moody eighteen year olds, and I'm not somebody who can just wipe it off my shoulder and just. Mm -hmm kind of keep going forward and uh you know some coaches love a little back and forth with players I'm not that guy like I, I'm sitting here I'm trying to help you get like like yeah I, I've done this for a while I, I made a living doing it like I'm not trying to argue with you I'm not trying to get you going every day and if a kid had a bad day and he popped back off the back it would affect me and I would take it home. And I realized that that wasn't for me. And uh, at least right now, at least right now, I'm, I'm not closing the door completely. But at least right now, um, I wanted to be there for my kids, especially with the passing of my father. Uh, I want to be there for my kids. I want to enjoy them growing up. I don't want to miss it. And uh, so that was one of the reasons I got out. And two, I really enjoyed doing the radio stuff. And I, and I didn't realize how much I enjoyed it until I didn't do it anymore. Because mm -hmm. I enjoy, I still enjoy the scouting aspect. I still enjoy being able to recognize talent. I still enjoy, uh, I really enjoy the X's and O's part. Uh, 
and and that was one thing that I, I got a plethora of working for, for Coach Brownell. But um, but I really enjoyed talking basketball with people to where after they got done talking with me, like, oh, now I get it. So I enjoy yeah. teaching. It's just a matter of uh, making it at a level to where people can understand the in- intricacies, but at the same time, not overwhelm people. Mm-hmm. And uh, whenever I kind of learned that whole ordeal, uh, I, I, I realized, man, like, I, I need to do the media thing because I, I think I could be good and I think I could help people understand it more. And um, I still love being around it. I love being around the coaches. As ornery as some of them are, I still like them. And um, sometimes the more ornery, the more I enjoy them because they're just, they, they, they'll say the funniest stuff and it just, it, <laughs> it'll evolve. And I like being a part of that atmosphere, but I, I don't necessarily like, um, I, I don't like the day to day as far as uh, dealing with uh, kids that woke up on the wrong side of bed. I, I, if I have to deal with kids that woke up, I'll deal with my kids. Yeah, Does sure. that make sense? Yeah, of course. How are you pursuing media in that avenue? I'm bugging people like you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I, I talked to uh, Rick Bagby. I, I published this magazine, which I'm going to send you later. We talked about it before we got on. Uh, the, it's Let It Fly with Terrence Oglesby presents the 2021 ACC breakdown. It's 82 pages. I did it all myself. Uh, one of the, there are no good things about a pandemic, but for me, the, the good thing about the pandemic, being able to be home and just kind of figure it out. I had to find mm-hmm. out things just to figure out. And I figured out uh, where I could print it, how I could do it, how I could format it. And then uh, the basketball stuff was easy enough. It was fun. And um, I'm just taking it one day at a time. I'm, I'm trying to get games at Upstate, at Furman. At, uh, I'm doing Anderson University stuff, which is right down the road from Clemson. I've done – I'm scheduled to do Syracuse men's basketball on the radio at home with Don Munson. I did Miami down there on the radio with William Quackenbush, both men and women. And I'm just kind of plugging away. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I don't know this for sure, but I've been told that people like me. So I'm hoping I'm likable enough to where people can put me on television. But um, I'm just taking it day by day. And uh, basically, anytime somebody emails me with something, I respond within five minutes. That's my big rule. Uh, my wife goes crazy because she sees me just checking my phone if there's any emails. That's yeah. kind of my thing. Like, that's I, what you got to do, sure. I know. Yeah, just to make sure. So that's kind of yeah. how I'm pursuing that. I'm trying to be, I, I want to be known as professional. I want to be known as somebody who's going to show up on time uh, and who does his homework. And, and I know what I'm getting into before I get into it. You also do something called the Beyond 22 Basketball Podcast. I've seen yeah. you know, your Facebook page on it. What is, what is that all about? It's just an ACC breakdown. I, I you know, I do also, um, I, I do also some, um, I call them quick 10 previews to where it'll be more of an X's and O type thing for mm-hmm. Clemson basketball, uh, just so people can just look at certain things. I wrote for Tiger Net. Uh, I've written for yeah. n- numerous other media outlets. And, uh, you know, I helped out with the athletic, uh, Atlanta. I've I've talked to CJ Moore several times about Clemson's basketball team. I I just, but the, uh, the quick 10 is basically, I'll give them a quick scouting report. So they'll know what to look for. It takes 10 minutes, pull it up on your phone before you walk in the gym. And then, um, the weekly show is just an ACC rundown. There's not one like that in South Carolina and especially not one that a Clemson guy's doing. Mm-hmm. So it, I think uh, you and I both know there's a heavy uh, tobacco triangle lean when it comes mm-hmm. to a lot of uh, ACC basketball stuff. And I, I'm kind of another voice uh, from outside of that. So uh, I talk, I talk with a, a young man named Faxon Childress. I don't know if you've watched the show, but Faxon's a very intelligent young person who wants to get in the business. And I, I, I really appreciate his perspective because he's TikTok and everything. And I don't even know how to, sp- how to spell TikTok. We talked about TikTok earlier. I don't know what TikTok is. I'm not going to download it. not going to do it. But uh, it's a fun back and forth. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy teaching. It's part of the teaching thing. And um, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. I, I do it for fun. I do it for experience. And, and hopefully one day, if I get the opportunity to do a studio show, uh, I won't freeze up as soon as that red light pops on. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. All about reps and yeah. getting used to it, right? Mm-hmm. You kind of led into it there, but you know, five years down the road, 
where do you see yourself? Where would you like to be? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know where I'd like to be. I, I'm not somebody who typically shares that stuff, but, okay. uh, <laughs> <'cause>, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I would like to be working at a major network. I'd like to be working, uh, both shows and games. I, I really enjoy doing games because I, I see it at a different level than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not just saying that from a place of arrogance. It's just, it's true. I see it differently. Uh, just being, I, I have both the perspective of a player and a coach, um, having done both. And um, I, I want to keep it relatable and I, and I don't want to overwhelm people. And um, m m one of my biggest idols, and obviously I would have to do it in a different way, uh, but I think the, the way that he conveys messages, the way that he conveys the X's and O's, uh, I really enjoy. And that's Kirk Herbstreit. And I got an opportunity to meet Kirk. A couple of years ago in Nashville, we were both walking our dogs. He had all, he had all of his golden retrievers. He's got like four of them. Mm. Uh, he would never remember that, but I, I did. And I, I just, I, I enjoy the way he's able to relay information. And uh, that's something I want to do. That's something I, I think I could do. It's just, uh, you need to know the right guy, Aaron. I know, I know you know that. And uh, you kind of have to have the right opportunity. And um, I'm hoping for it. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it. I enjoyed talking to you definitely easy to talk to you know a lot about basketball i think you'd be great for any job whether it was you know color analyst or hosting so good luck and yeah, hopefully you. we'll see it doing more of it down the line it's not getting me to talk it's getting me to shut up is the problem you gotta <laughs> get me to shut up in time for commercial breaks that's that's like the hardest part for me i gotta shut up in time for commercial breaks you do you gotta you gotta make sure the play-by-play -play guy can call the, the play right yeah don't talk right. over everything and then get out for commercials <laughs> thanks for listening make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you don't ever miss an episode of acc stars where are they now